Good evening there, everybody. What is happening? Hopefully you all are having a wonderful day today. So when it comes down to it, I thought, of course, that I would review this little video that I thought would be very particularly interesting. And this is going to be a video by the boxing channel named Dante's Boxing Nation. I thought that this video had an interesting amount of points from both sides of the debate, which of course we're going to see very particularly soon. But the main conversation of this video is going to be that of Devin the Dream Haney. And Devin the Dream Haney, of course, for those of you that watched his last fight, he was able to get, I believe, the unanimous decision victory over that of Vasily Hightech Lomachenko. Of course, a lot of people thought that it was a disputable decision. A lot of people thought that Vasily Lomachenko should have won that fight. I probably also would have gave Lomachenko the slight decision just because I thought that he had the more impactful punches and had hurt Devin Haney more than vice versa. But one also could argue that Haney was more busy in certain rounds and that the bodywork maybe just got to Lomachenko. One could debate. It was a very close fight. So once again, like I said, I've never really called the fight personally a robbery in my personal view. But once again, for those of you that have watched my videos in the past on this channel, you know that I've said that a fighter truly gets exposed as an all-time great or that we don't truly know how great a fighter actually will be once they, first of all, start facing true A great caliber competition, which is a big part of the reason why I've never had Terrence Bud Crawford or Naoya in a way as my true number one pound for pound fighter, even though certain people have disagreed with me in the past, or B, when they finally start facing fighters that can handle their capabilities and their size and their weight and their reach. And I think when it comes to Devin Haney, and I've compared with this a lot, it's almost like that of the Oscar De La Hoya experience. Oscar De La Hoya, for those of you that remember watching him throughout the 90s, and I was not born when Oscar De La Hoya first started boxing. I was born in 1998, but I do know a lot about Oscar De La Hoya and a lot about certain older fighters. And Oscar, of course, was mainly the main golden boy of that of boxing, at least the main one that was being highly promoted. He had the look, of course, he had the Mexican-American and Mexican following, at least to a certain degree later on in his career. But Oscar De La Hoya, the thing that I've always said about him, which in my personal view, which always made him a little bit of an overrated fighter in terms of his career, which is that he got some very big wins in the early part of his career, some phenomenally big wins, especially over that of Julio Cesar Chavez Sr. and that of Pernell Sweet P. Whitaker. But once Oscar De La Hoya really started moving up the weight classes and started fighting against fighters that not only were A-grade level fighters, but also could handle his capabilities and his skill set and especially his size and his reach, Oscar De La Hoya, it was very apparent when it was not apparent before that certain holes were being exposed in his game. And when you have certain fighters like that that are fighting in a weight class that they pretty much are not a natural 135 pounder or something of that sort, they're going to look better than what they actually are. You know, because of course, once Oscar De La Hoya started moving up the weight classes and started facing guys like Sugar Shane Mosley or Floyd Mayweather Jr. or certain other guys, Oscar De La Hoya lost the majority of those fights. And of course, one could debate that Felix Tito Trinidad was a little bit controversial and the Sugar Shane Mosley rematch was controversial. But one also could argue that Oscar De La Hoya, having probably the size advantage, and with Sugar Shane Mosley moving up to weight classes, that Oscar should have never got dominated in that first fight in the first place. Especially with Shane, in my view, being, you know, a great fighter, but someone who also had a little bit of a limited skill set compared to other all-time great fighters. That's why, in my view, I've always had Oscar De La Hoya as a little bit of an overrated fighter. Like in many of my Canelo Alvarez videos, I've always had Canelo over him because not only, in my view, is Canelo Alvarez a more skilled fighter, but whenever Canelo Alvarez actually moved up the weight classes, he was actually more successful than that of Oscar De La Hoya. And it's hard for many people to accept the fact that, yes, Canelo Alvarez not only was a better, but a greater fighter than Oscar De La Hoya. It just is what it is. Now, the big question is this. Will the same thing happen to that of a Devin Haney? Or that of a T. Fima Lopez. Now, I can't really mention T. Fima Lopez's name quite in there as of right now. Because T. Fima Lopez, of course, he was most recently able to beat that of Josh Taylor. And some would even say dominate Josh Taylor. Who, of course, was looked at by many people as the number one overall guy of that weight division. Now, of course, certain people also may say that the year layoff may have had a little bit of a factor 
and of course that Josh may have been on the slight decline, which, you know, it's very possible. I also believe that those were a little bit of factors. I also believe that Josh Taylor was probably a little bit overrated in terms of his skill set, just my personal view of it, because he did not have a very good plan B in that fight, and he showed a very limited ability in that of the mid-range and the long game, especially with his jab and his cross. But, you know, that's neither here nor there for the moment. But the big question is now about Mr. Devin Haney, who, of course, was able to recently get the biggest win of his career over Vasily Lomachenko. But Devin Haney, of course, has said for a while that he has been thinking about moving up to the 140-pound weight class because, of course, he is not going to be able to stay at the 135 or the lightweight class forever because, of course, he is not a natural lightweight. So the big question is about Mr. Devin Haney is that is he going to flourish once he starts moving up the weight classes the same way that he has done at the 135-pound weight division? Or just like Oscar De La Hoya or other certain fighters that may have had certain holes in their gains before, is he maybe going to get certain exposure in terms of some of the holes in his gain? No one, of course, knows for sure until he goes up there. But Sergio Mora, who of course was a former professional boxer himself, I believe from around the 160 to 168 pound weight classes, possibly even 154. He personally believes that Devin Haney, with his next potential fight against that of Regis Progray, he believes that it's very possible that Regis Progray can win and dominate that fight. And he's going to explain why, and Dante is going to explain his sides as well. And I just thought that it was a very interesting video. But anyways, let's get straight into the conversation. Let's see what they have to say. Dante's Boxing Nation, what's going on, guys? So today, Regis Progre, he'll be defending his WBC title for the first time against Daniel Lito Zarilla. Regis, he should definitely win this fight, and the longer he keeps that belt, the better chance he has of landing the biggest fight of his career and the biggest payday. We all know that Devin Haney is moving up to 140 soon. The Regis Progre fight is actually a fight that Devin has been wanting for quite some time. But bigger opportunities trump that, like becoming undisputed at the lightweight division and fighting against Vasily Lomachenko. Now that Devin Haney has become undisputed and beat Lomachenko, he's on to the next. And because Devin has so many options... I'll give Devin Haney this. He has always showed, at least in my personal view, that he is willing to take the big fights almost no matter who they are. And I would have to give him a lot of credit if he actually is willing to take on Regis Pro Gray. Because Regis Progre would be a very big threat to anybody moving up to the 140-pound weight class. He's very powerful. He has, you know, somewhat of a very particular set of skills, uh, you know, and he's, he's, a, he's a very good fighter. Now, Regis Progre has some holes in his games as well, in his game as well, but for possibly moving up to 140 for the first fight, I would have to give Devin Haney a lot of credit because that would show that he has a great amount of confidence within himself. Options now, there's no telling exactly who his next opponent is going to be. Dev, originally, he was supposed to attend this Regis Pro Gray fight, but at the last minute, he changed his mind, which means there's a very good chance that Devin Haney is leaning towards the top rank offers over the... Well, Dante, we all know that if Devin Haney was a Caucasian or a Latin fighter, that you would debate that Devin Haney is scared of quote-unquote Regis Pro Gray, as many of the people have alleged with Usyk, with Wilder, and many other fighters. But, you know, it is what it is. The zone offers, which would be Regis Progray. Bob Arum said that he's going to offer Devin Haney either the Shakur Stevenson fight, a Lomachenko rematch, or a Teofimo Lopez fight. Now, all of those would be big fights and competitive fights. Now, when it comes to the Regis Progray fight in particular, because of the new weight class, because of Regis' style, his aggressive style and skill set, it would definitely be a very intriguing fight. In fact, the zone Sergio Mora, he's picking Regis Progre to beat Devin Haney. He believes Devin Haney is not going to be able to deal with the power and the size. Sergio, he said, I would have to say right off the bat, Regis Progre, he's a natural 140 pounder. A very smart, strong softball. The resume is there. The power's there. The style's there. And the hunger's there. Ever since well, I give him three out of four because the resume is not there for Regis Progre. 
I never really understood certain people that always try to put Regis Progray up there with the other elite fighters in terms of the boxing. And don't get me wrong, he is very talented in certain ends. But what resume does he really have? I mean, if we're really going to go there, even Jose Ramirez has a better resume at 140 than that of Regis Progray. I mean, Regis Progray's greatest win of his career is over Jose Zapata and over Julius Sandango. What does that really say about his career? And don't get me wrong, I'm not blaming any of that on Regis Progray or anything. He's taken a lot of the fights that he's needed to. But when we talk about the resume, I mean, what, what resume are we really talking about? Since Regis Progray lost to Josh Taylor, he's won four in a row, all four by knockout. I think power will be the deciding factor here, and Haney has already been shook at 135. I think if he steps up five pounds north, it's going to be a big difference against a monster like Regis Progray. You know, it amazes me to hear some of the things that you hear Sergio Mora say, because I would expect that to come from someone who is a casual fan, not someone who covers boxing for a living and has actually been in the ring and has boxed professionally for years. It would just seem to me that Sergio Mora would know automatically you cannot base how a person is going to take a punch or how they're going to deal with bigger fighters because they got rocked in a smaller weight class. Canelo Alvarez, he was right. Right, but Dante, I think that you're mainly missing the point or missing the big picture of the matter. I don't think that Sergio Mora is saying that Devin Haney is going to have a lot of problems with Regis Progray just because he got rocked once or twice in the lower weight classes. I think that he pretty much thinks the same thing that I do about Devin Haney, which is that even though he's a great fighter and even though he's a great talent, Devin Haney has a lot of holes in his game. I don't think that he has a particularly great defense. He does not have the greatest of power uh, when it comes down to it. At times, his foot positioning can be a little bit off. I, when it comes to Devin Haney, just in my personal view, and I'm not saying that he's not a clever fighter. I think that he's a clever fighter. But when I just talk about Devin Haney, there's just nothing that really pops off the page in terms of all-time great to me. When you talk about other fighters like Canelo Alvarez or Floyd Mayer the Jr. or Andre Ward or, you know, someone like, I don't know, whoever the hell else you want to compare, Manny Pacquiao, that have become multiple weight division champions, they were usually all-time great within a multitude of categories, whether it be punching power, hand speed, foot movement, footwork, defense, offense, you know, jab. I just don't see anything from Devin Haney, in my view, that really pops off the page in terms of all-time great. Maybe his one-two combination. But other than that, Devin Haney comes across to me as a fighter that I just don't think that he's meant to be undefeated for very long. When you talk about other fighters like that, of a Shakur Stevenson, Javante Tank Davis, even a Lomachenko, all those guys, in my personal view, they have certain categories in their style that scream all-time great to me. Javante Tank Davis not only has all-time great power, but in my view, he has very good defense. He's a very great all-around fighter. Shakur Stevenson has very great feet as well, in my view. He's very quick when it comes down to it, and he has a great offensive skill set. Once again, there's just nothing in my personal view about Devin Haney that really super-duper pops off the page. That doesn't mean that he's not a top 10 pound for pound fighter. That doesn't mean that he's not a great fighter or that he's not an A-grade fighter. But I think that very soon, within these next 10 fights of his career... I'm not quite sure how much longer Devin Haney is really going to be undefeated, just in my personal view. And Regis Progray might be the one to potentially defeat him. I'm not quite sure, but Regis Progray also has a lot of holes as well because he's a very defensively irresponsible fighter. He keeps his hands down a lot in particular fights, and that's a big part of the reason of what caused him the Josh Taylor fight. So we'll see what ends up happening in that fight. But the main thing that would worry me about Devin Haney is not the fact that he's gotten rocked within lower weight classes because there's been dozens, if not hundreds of fighters that became great fighters, even though they were rocked in lower weight classes and they were successful in higher weight classes. You know, like Miguel Cotto, he would get rocked in certain fights like against Jose Torres or Demarcus Chop Chop Corley. And then, of course, he became a great fighter at 147, 154. And then later on, of course, he was able to win the title at 160 pounds. But the thing that alarms me about Devin Haney, and of course there's several other fighters that I can bring up for that category as well, like Floyd and other fighters. But the thing that worries me about Devin Haney is 
not really that he gets rocked. It's really how many times he gets rocked. Against Vasily Lomachenko, he was rocked several different times. Against Jojo Diaz, he was rocked, I believe, once or twice in that fight, when really he should have never been rocked at all. He was also rocked a little bit against Jorge Linares. Now, I thought that it was clear that Devin Haney was stepping off the gas because he knew that he pretty much had that fight in the bag. But the thing that worries me about Devin Haney is that, once again, there's just nothing about his skill set in my personal view or his athleticism that really super duper pops off the page when you talk about beating great fighters. Now, in my view, Regis Progray, he's not a Shakur Stevenson or a Javante Tank Davis. He's not as skilled as those fighters. But what Regis Progray does bring to the table is that he's going to be more near the same size as Devin Haney, and he does have great power, and he's a decent inside fighter when he has to be. And Devin Haney, in my view, just like Timothy Bradley had said, it's not that he's a bad inside fighter, but he's not the best inside fighter that I've ever seen. He takes way too many hits for his own good. And that would be the main thing that I'd be worried about Devin Haney if I were a Devin Haney fan. Once again, a very good fighter, but is he ever going to be an all-time great fighter? Time will tell. Maybe I'm misjudging it, but when I take a look at Devin Haney, he just gets hit way, way, way too much. By Jose Cotto in a smaller weight class. Andre Ward was rocked by an opponent at a smaller weight class when he was fighting at, what, 168 or 160? Manny Pacquiao was knocked out multiple times in much, much smaller weight classes. And we see what Manny Pacquiao did after his two knockout losses. At right, but just to make those comparisons, Dante, and the reason why we can't make those same comparisons to Devin Haney is because Andre Ward and Canelo Alvarez, for example, uh, you know, Canelo Alvarez was at that time a little bit inexperienced. And he pretty much was only rocked once like that's the only time i've really seen canelo alvarez majorly rocked to the point to where he was almost knocked down in his career but in a lot of other of his better fights and his more elite fights canelo alvarez usually performed a lot more consistently and it's the same thing with andre ward yeah andre ward was knocked down against i believe that one fighter darnell boone but in a lot of his other bigger fights like against mikhail kessler or carl frosch he came to really prove himself like, we can also bring up Tyson Fury. Like, yeah, Tyson Fury, he was knocked down, I believe, against Steve Cunningham, and he was knocked down against other fighters. But then against Vladimir Klitschko and Deontay Wilder, he showed his best. The thing is with Devin Haney, though, is that almost whatever performance that he's fighting in, he usually seems to get rocked a few times within the fight, or he seems to overall be very defensively, I'm not going to say irresponsible, but he seems to have a little bit of a hole in terms of his defense. He just gets hit way, way, way too much. And just to talk about the Manny Pacquiao comparison as well, Manny Pacquiao, when he ended up getting knocked out in the first part of his career, he was very, very raw and a guy that clearly was not fully cooked at that point in time. You know, he really started improving as a fighter once he got with Freddie Roach, but once he started improving, he had very consistent performances. The thing is about Devin Haney with me, once again, is that in almost every single fight that he is in, <laughs> he pretty much gets rocked and he just looks like he has a very big hole in his defense. And he's not the worst defensive fighter that I've ever seen. You know, he's not Pauly Miles Nagy or anything, but he's certainly no Floyd Mayer the Jr. Much higher weight classes. The most dangerous punch to get hit with in the sport of boxing is a punch you don't see. It doesn't matter what we I agree. And Devin Haney, a lot of the times, does not see certain punches in coming. That's why he was hurt against Lomachenko several times. He was hurt against Jojo Diaz once or twice. He was hurt against Jorge Linares. And I'm not, I don't really personally remember him getting hurt against George Cambosis. There was a few times where he got hit by punches there that he also should have not got hit with had his skill set been more higher improved. So like I said, we'll see what happens with Mr. Devin Haney. The class you're at, it doesn't even matter if the person who hit you is the hardest puncher in the sport or one of the hardest punchers. He doesn't even have to be a puncher because there have been a lot of fighters in the history of the sport who had a really, really solid chin and end up getting knocked out by a person who was not known for his power. Oh, and by the way, I mentioned to say this before I even said that, but it also needs to be noted that Sergio Mora, he also picked George Cambosis to beat Devin Haney. So I'll say this, as good as Regis Progre is, I believe that Devin Haney would definitely beat him. I believe Devin Haney, you know, he's a master at controlling range and distance. He just steps his game up. The better the competition, the better performance you will see from Devin Haney. Eventually, we're going to get... I somewhat agree with that, even though I thought that against Lomachenko that 
he did a little bit worse than what I had once originally predicted, even though I predicted Lomachenko to be more competitive than any other fighter in Devin Haney's career. But I don't really see Devin Haney in my view. He's not a guy that mentally crumbles. He's a guy that in my view that, you know, he's, you know, he has a lot of mental fortitude in my personal opinion. The problem in my view is not really the belief in himself. It's not really the mental fortitude. I think that he has great belief in himself. And of course, that's a great thing. He has great heart. The main problem that I see with Devin Haney is that his defense is just very, very, very leaky. A big announcement from Devin Haney, and it's going to be against, hopefully, one of those viable opponents. But if Devin Haney does decide to fight against Regis Progray next, then people like Sergio Mora picking Regis Progray to win the fight makes the fight just that much bigger. Let's see how it all plays out. That's all. It'd be a very interesting fight. I'm not quite sure who really would win that one. It'd be very hard to predict because Regis Progray, uh, even though he has the type of power and a little bit of a skill set to threaten that at Devin Haney, he has a lot of holes in his game as well. A lot of the times he takes punches as well that he should not need uh, or that he doesn't need to um, or that he shouldn't be taking. Uh, and a lot of the times he just keeps his hands down way too long. Like There will be times where he's right there in the exchanges and he'll just take punches and, and Regis Progray needs to watch out. He does not have... The greatest head movement that I've ever seen. He also does not have the greatest defense that I've ever seen. But he does have great athleticism. But we'll see what happens with Mr. Devin Haney. All I got for now, guys. I'm on to the next one. But anyways, that's pretty much about it for today. I just thought that that was very particularly interesting. Like I said, we'll see where Mr. Devin Haney goes from here. I also said the same thing of Mr. T. Fimo Lopez. T. Fimo was able to beat that of Josh Taylor. Certain people may debate a lesser version of Josh Taylor. But, you know, it is what it is. He was able to beat him nonetheless, who was an undefeated fighter and the former undisputed champion. We'll see where this goes, but Devin Haney, whatever fight he takes next, it is going to be very interesting. He is, as of current, one of the best and one of the better fighters in the world. Uh, we'll see if that holds up in the long run against certain fighters like Shakur Stevenson, Javante Tang Davis, uh, and potentially higher weight class fights, maybe against Tiafima Lopez or a Regis Progre or a Josh Taylor, any one of those fights. So it's going to be very interesting. We'll see what happens. But anyways, that's pretty much about it for today. Thank you so much for watching. I'll talk to you all later.